is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The yen surges on reports that the Bank of Japan will nominate former member of the policy board, Kazuo Ueda, to replace Governor Kuroda, who's due to step down in the spring. Well, Adidas shares tumble after the company also warns it may report a loss of 700 million euros this year after cutting ties with rapper Yi. And the UK economy contracts more than expected in December, but does avoid a recession by the narrowest of margins. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. I have to say it's all about the yen. This was the big surprise. We also need to look at oil. Oil is a big one after we saw from Russia that they will actually take some barrels off the market. That sent actually crude up 2.5 percent at 80 dollars yen. Now, this is where a lot of the action happened earlier this morning. Uh, this really came as a surprise to the markets by the fact that there was a possible appointment. This was reported by the Nikkei by someone who, um, well, A is not who was expected, but also because the deputy governor is, we think, not interested in the job, it could really point to a huge fight between the government and the Bank of Japan. That Japanese 10-year yield, uh, 0502. We did hear from our Mark Cudmore saying, look, this is just a knee-jerk reaction right now, so let's wait for the next couple of days to really see what happens. But for the moment, and we have a great live blog, which I urge everyone to go and see it. It's both on the Bloomberg terminal, but also on the website. There have been various reports that we're also trying to get confirmed. And for the moment, yen still climbing. So the Nikkei and others reporting that the, uh, well, that Japan is set to nominate Kazuo Ueda as BOJ governor. The yen, as we were just saying, climbing on the news, suggesting that investors see the choice as hawkish. Well, the BOJ governor, Mr. Kuroda set to leave in April after the longest stint at the helm of the central bank in its 140-year history. Well, joining us now is Guy Foster. He's chief strategist at Bruin Dolphin and Bloomberg's currency and rate strategist, Vin Ram. So thank you both for joining us. Vin, what's your reaction to this? So I don't know whether the market is worried about, the, you know, the policy of some of that we haven't really heard for the last 10 years. So we want to, to figure out what it means if he does become appointment or they worry about this fight between the government and the BOJ. Morning, Francine. I don't think that the markets are concerned about the fight between the government and the BOJ because it looks like the way I'm seeing it all play out is, is the way I'm going to say it now, is that they, they first floated a trial balloon last week, as we know about Ambamiya taking the role, and the market reaction wasn't so good. It wasn't positive in terms of the yen, and the government didn't want that. And so they went to UADA who is more seen as a pragmatic person, at, at any rate, much more hawkish than Amamiya. And therefore, Ueda got, is, is getting the role from the looks of it. He seems to be the right candidate for the moment, balancing short-term needs and long-term concerns for Japan's economy. So, Guy, what's your take on this? When you look at some of the complexities over this, is it a knee-jerk reaction? Or, as Ven says, this is, you know, the right path for a, possibly just a, a different way forward for the Bank of Japan? I don't know if we can place too much um, importance in the exact person who's going to lead at this stage, because until someone takes the role, you don't really know no. uh, what kind of stance they're going to take. I mean, we've seen that particularly with some of the members of the MPC, like Catherine Mann was expected to be a very dovish member. She's ended up being the most hawkish uh, on the committee. So, you know, in the, in the context of the BOJ, I think if you look at the, the background here, um, we've got uh, inflation looking like it's beginning to meet the BOJ's goals at a time when the BOJ itself yeah. is saying that they're not go it's not going to be sustainable. If, the, if that's the BOJ's... Uh, impression, then they're effectively say, saying that Kuroda's policies after this very long stint in power have effectively yeah. failed. And but we know they're causing a lot of disruption to the JGB yeah. market. So ultimately, they need to withdraw from this policy. And you're absolutely right, Gay, that you know, we need to wait and see a little bit. But to, to also Ven's very good point, the fact that there's a deputy governor, right, Mr. Amamiya, who we think or whose reported refusal to take the top job, is that what markets are, are focusing on? Well, I think they are, they're they focusing on the fact that he hasn't taken the job and therefore this story that, uh, earlier that we had the continuity candidate who was going to be taking the role, um, that looks to be wrong. 
the reasons, whether it's wrong as you report, you know, perhaps he's, he's turned it down. But honestly, I, I don't feel uh, able to comment on that with any certainty yeah. right at the moment. But yes, the market's reaction definitely here is that anyone, um, anyone other than the deputy governor is going to be a more hawkish candidate. And that's what's uh, driving the yen at the moment. Um, Van, I mean, is it different when, you know, you could have, for example, you know, a, a very staunch, you know, inflation wariness, but then when you're in the top job, you look at things differently. How do, how do people change when they become either, you know, in charge of central banks or on the governing council member? Absolutely, Francine. I do think that there's going to be plenty of pressure on Ueda as he takes on this role, and I think that he will be acutely aware that having been a BOG board member himself, and he knows... Uh, that uh, Japan has been in secular stagnation, and now we've got this bout of inflation. So I think he will be acutely aware that he needs to manage not just the short-term needs, but also the long-term concerns and uh, the uh, troubles that Japan has faced with in reviving inflation, secular inflation, I mean. And I, I think what we know about him at this stage is that he is against this negative interest, uh, negative interest rate policy is possibly, I mean, given his comments, it's uh, it, it's hard to tell, but it looks like he may be against curve control as well. So, but he's not going to go, uh, he's not going to go extreme and start raising rates in a hurry. But though I do think that it, all possible indications of that, there is going to be a change in policy at some point. So, then you believe that basically low rates and that yield curve control policy are definitely under pressure, no matter who takes charge at this point. Yes, I definitely think so, and that is and that is what we see in the end reaction. Because if if BOJ scraps, scraps curve control, it's becoming a completely dysfunctional market, the JGB market. I mean, the BOJ is is there like eighty as a eighty percent percent. I mean, and that they can't be buying these uh, defending the curve control when there is so much speculation and when there is so much speculation to pull the curve to push the curve higher, the BOJ has to yeah. really really let go of. Because of control. And you agree with that guy, right? That that this is not this is where we're headed, no matter who's in charge. That's ab absolutely right. And I think you know this is a surprise announcement. Whatever the reasons behind the surprise, we're in a phase with the Bank of Japan now where everything has to be a surprise. It was a surprise when they widened yield curve control before. Um, and I think they would very much like to be able to, to abolish it or widen it further. Yeah. Uh, before too much speculative pressure starts forcing them to make larger purchases um, as, they've, as we've seen around previous BOJ me uh, meetings. I, I want to ask you both actually about inflation generally, but guys specifically about the fact that Russia has said that it will cut oil output by 500,000 barrels a day really in response to the Western price cap. So this is retaliation. Does that meaningfully change what you're expecting the price of oil to do over the medium term? Um, I mean, with that, because we don't really make a point estimate for oil, I mean, we're bullish on oil, um, mainly around the China reopening. I think this contributes to what is already a pretty good setup for oil and pretty good setup for oil producing companies. Uh, Van, very quickly, what's your take on, you know, A, importing inflation from China coupled with this higher price for oil? Definitely, Francine. I, I do think that that points to short-term inflationary pressures in Japan for the time being, and that will in, uh, in turn impose greater pressure on the new uh, BOJ dispensation to do something with the curve control. And that means that uh, real rate differentials will narrow in favor of the yen against the dollar, and that will put the wind in the sails of the yen. All right, thank you both for joining us. Ruin Dolphin, Chief Strategist Guy Foster, and Bloomberg's Currency and Rate Strategist Ven Ram. Coming up, more headaches for the Adani Group after MSCI cuts the weighting of some of its companies. We'll have all of the details next, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, MSCI has cut the weighting of four Adani companies and its indices after reviewing the number of shares it considers freely available. Now, the move triggered a further sell-off of Adani stocks, which have shed value following a report from short seller Heidenberg last month. Well, joining us now is Abhishek Vishnoi, Bloomberg senior reporter on our Asian equities team. Abhishek, thank you for joining us. So, how would MSCI's action actually impact Adani Group? Well, uh, it's, um, it's an index provider, uh, probably world's most famous, most tracked index provider. Um, and it is tracked by trillions of dollars of investment. So whoever is uh, following those indexes um, watches closely what is going in, what is coming out of the index, uh, where the weighting is rising, where is the weighting falling. So uh, given that the free float uh, outlook or assessment has been cut by MSCI for four of Adani Group's mm -hmm. key companies, uh, it's likely to lead to a conclusion that uh, their weighting would reduce as and when uh, the moves become effective at the end of this month. And that would, uh, by design, means uh, you know passive outflows. Now, the estimated outflows, uh, you know, from uh, based on our reporting, range between 400 million to 500 million, 570 million dollars uh, from those four firms. But uh, you know, it in a way also increases the uh, probability of uh, many of Adani Group's companies uh, being kicked right. out of MSCI in the next quarterly or semi-annual review. Now, this was just the passive side. So, the number may look small. But keep in mind, the active investors would you know, position before these changes become effective. So this, this actually yeah. is worsening the sell-off for the group. So t tell me a little bit about wh why are some of the bonds getting interest from investors? Like, when is that likely to happen with equities? Yeah, it's not been happening that fast for equities, but on the bond side, uh, we have seen uh, you know firms like uh, based on our reporting, Oak Tree and Davidson Kemper, you know, coming in and buying some of the bonds because a lot of them had fallen into distressed territory. There, there was value emerging. Sell side, including uh, names like Goldman Sachs, were pretty excited about the value that bonds offer. And you know, in in terms of hierarchy, uh, bond holders, debt holders come in before equity holders. Um, and therefore, there was some value on the table that these uh, guys, uh, you know, uh, positioned for. Um, and all this is happening in context of, uh, you know, some of the group's companies, Adani, uh, Adani group, uh, Group's family actually repaying some loans, uh, pledging that uh, they would reduce their debt equity ratios. Um, mm -hmm. More such news would definitely evoke similar sentiment uh, in stocks, I'm told. Thank you so much. Bloomberg's Abhishek Vishnoi there with the very latest on, of course, Adani. Let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Thousands of aid workers are pouring into Turkey and Syria, where deaths from Monday's massive earthquakes have now risen past 20,000. Turkish President Erdogan is facing mounting criticism over the country's poor construction record and his government's response to the disaster. In Syria, the first UN aid shipment has arrived, loaded with blankets, hygiene products, and also materials to give people temporary shelter. Now, Ukrainian officials say Russia has targeted the country with fresh missile strikes overnight, hitting Kharkiv in the northeast as well as central southern regions. The renewed attacks come just as Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky finishes a tour of Europe. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, President Zelensky's chief diplomatic advisor called for more weapons. We have to be prepared that by the end of February, March, or even even in, in, in further, they might try to make a revenge. That's why we should be more prepared than a year ago. And British billionaire Jim Radcliffe is said to have lined up banks, including Goldman Sachs, to finance a bid to buy Manchester United. A source says the lenders are prepared to fund a takeover offer for the English football club with both bonds and loans, including covering Man United's existing $800 million of debt. Shares in the company did surge this week on reports Qatari investors are also circling. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. 
business in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrins and this is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Coming up, the UK narrowly avoids recession 2022, but the economy still has not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. So we break down the latest data next, and this is Bloomberg. The UK economy shrank by 0.5% on the month in December, leaving fourth quarter GDP unchanged from the previous quarter, rising 0.4% year on year, matching estimates. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. So, Lizzie, break down the data for us. Not as, I mean, we skirted a recession, so we're not in recession, but actually it's a little bit worse than expected. Yeah, just narrowly dodging a technical recession. Even though you had strikes weighing on growth in December, now the question really is, are we going to have fully averted a recession or have we just delayed it? And if you look at the Bank of England's forecasts, they say that we are going to have a recession, but it'll be shorter and shallower than expected. NISA, though, the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, says there won't be a recession. But either way, the margin really is razor thin. So we heard from the Bank of England Chief Economist Hugh Pill yesterday at the Treasury Select Committee. He says that in any case, the economy is going to bob around around the zero level. So that just perpetuates the challenge for Jeremy Hunt, the choice between uh, higher taxes or lower spending. And in response to the figures this morning, he said that the UK is the fastest growing G7 economy, yeah. which is an ironic stat to point to, because if you really look at it, the UK is the only G7 country still below pre-pandemic levels. So how does this data actually impact the, the political argument over growth? I mean, it's a choice between stagnation and recession. Um, so the push for growth is going to continue as we head towards the March budget and beyond. Yeah. You've got Liz Truss, the former prime minister, pushing for growth, trying to make the case to be the face of that argument. But also the CBI, Britain's biggest lobby group, uh, b business lobby group, saying that tax breaks for business will be the difference between recession and growth. Labour Party pushing for it as well. Really, Francine, I think the elephant in the room here is Brexit. Bloomberg Economics, as you know, has said that the cost of Brexit is £100 billion a year, costing 4% of the economy uh, since we departed from the European Union. Uh, and it's a hit to the labour market. It's also a hit to business investment. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Byrne there with the very late. And of course, on the political front, the UK Labour Party's momentum does seem to be building also with this win in Lancashire. Now, the former chief executive officer of Aston Martin says the UK must drastically increase production of electric vehicles or risk losing its manufacturing capability. Well, Bloomberg's Louise Moon has the story. If the future is electric, then the UK needs to put the pedal to the metal. 70 years ago, Britain was the world's second biggest car manufacturing base, but has now slipped to 18th place. Falling production of combustion engines hasn't been met by an equal drive towards electrification. We're losing that, that pivot. We're losing out to uh, competition in Japan, in China, in Europe and in the US, and it's a real problem. And we're staring into the abyss. There is a real risk that we'll lose our manufacturing capability. It adds to a bleak overall picture for the auto industry. Figures show car manufacturing's contribution to the UK economy fell to 14 billion in 2021, and car output slumped last year to the lowest since 1956. Adding to the headwinds are Brexit-induced red tape, a lack of workers, global chip shortages and soaring energy costs. But there have been some glimmers of hope as chip supplies improve and industry giants pile in some cash. The sector, however, needs a strong boost if it wants to get out of first gear. Bloomberg's Louise Moon reporting there. Now, a couple of things that we need to watch out for. Brent, uh, Brent jumping as Russia is planning to cut some of uh, the production of oil, about 500,000 barrels. What this means also for the UK, UK economy is something that we'll be covering every Thursday when we talk all things UK, 9.30 a.m. in our half an hour special. Now, let's check in on some of the stocks that are also on the move. We start with Standard Chartered. This is a UK bank, very skewed towards, of course, Asia, but something that we need to keep a very, very close close eye on. Standard Chartered coming out and this is on the back of expectations uh, that somebody would come in there and actually make a move on it. This is FAB 
and they have said that they will not do so. So don't hold your breath for that. Abu Dhabi's FAB is quietly uh, reading another run at Standard Chartered. It's our own reporting, although they have said they would not do that openly. The other story we're watching out for is what Oliver Crook was telling us, and this is Adidas. Adidas slumping as the chief executive is mapping out the worst case scenario for Yeezy. Uh, the German sneaker brand really said the worst case scenario is if it has to write off all existing Yeezy inventory, so the stock fell as much as 11% on the back of it. And then we, of course, look at Enel. This is a giant in electricity uh, based in Italy, but really widely accepted as one of the most transformative electricity brands going away from dirty fuel to some of the electrification and in today's trading session gaining some 3.2 percent a couple of other stories we need to watch out for we've been talking about almost nothing else all day and this is the bank of japan with yen um, this is the picture so far so we've had some smart commentary from across the board yen gaining we need to First of all, take this with a pinch of salt. Look, there are reports saying that uh, an academic, Kazuo Ueda, will be nominated as BOJ chief. Uh, it's a surprise. The Nikkei is reporting that he is the favorite after Mr. Amamiya declined. So what that means for Yen longer term is something that we need to, I guess, take a deep breath and try and reopen that. Coming up, we have more on the Bank of Japan. Uh, and we ask ourselves why Ueda can be painted as a hawk rel relative to the nonstop money printing machine that the BOJ has become. This is Bloomberg. The yen surges on reports the Bank of Japan will nominate former member of the policy board Kazuo Ueda to replace Governor Kuroda, who is due to step down in the spring. Adidas shares tumble after the company warns it may report a loss of 700 million euros this year after cutting ties with rapper Yi. And the UK economy contracts more than expected in December but avoids a recession by the narrowest of margins. Good morning everyone and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. The Nikkei newspaper and others are reporting that the Japanese government plans to appoint Kazuo Ueda as the Bank of Japan's next governor. Now, the yen higher on the reports. Earlier today, we asked some of our guests for their reaction. Probably the first reaction of the market is the uh, knee-jerk reaction to whatever the name is different from Mr. Mamiya. But Mr. Ueda has been uh, uh, generally dovish when he was in with the BOJ when 1998. 2003, he actually opposed the raise of interest rate at the time of 2000 when BOJ actually decided to raise interest rate from zero to positive territory. There is a perception uh, that we, he will be more hawkish and hence we've seen um, that uh, uh, rally in the yen. And look what happened um, over the past few months as we've seen the uh, rally in the yen from the high 140s to 130 or so right now um, against the dollar. This will, be, this will provide a good balance between the fresh uh, eyes and also the deep knowledge about the what is the BOJ is all about. To take positions right now on the back of this uh, is quite risky because it's conjecture. Well, we're now joined by Nick Smith, Japan strategist with CLSA Securities. Nick, thank you for joining us. What are we looking at? Why is the market so surprised by this? What we have is complete shambles. So uh, there were nine names on my list. I think the top of the list were Amamiya, Yamaguchi, He, Nakatsu. We knew from the end of last year that uh, all of them were cautious about taking on the job. They, we knew that they they regarded it as, as something of a, um, a poison chalice. Uh, the uh, Nikkei on Monday said it's pretty much a done deal, that it's uh, Amamiya. We'd started to get comfortable with that idea, and now we hear that he's turned it down. Uh, we knew last week that um, Nakaso had taken a job with, uh, with Apex, so quite possibly he'd turned it down as well. So yeah. initially, we got some concerns and saying, well, it looks as if uh, no one wants to particularly do the job. And then we're ending up right. with what is a compromise candidate of, for the first time in its 100-plus years' uh, history, we've got the, the BOJ talking about having a university Nick, professor as the governor. I know, but it seems, and, and we had this at the MPC and the Bank of England, like you come in the job and actually you look at the facts and maybe you change. From people that know him, Mr. Ueda seems a little bit, you know, seems quite like a pragmatist. So the mar is the market reaction overdone? 
again, I understand that anyone but Amamiya would have been seen as a hawk. I think that's uh, certainly the case, that um, Amamir was seen as a, a, a more of the same kind of guy, um, which may have been uh, a little unfair to him, um, and then anybody else would, would be uh, a hawk by comparison. You go through the literature of what he said in English and what he said in Japanese seem to be a, a little bit different, um, and he, he's had quite a range of things. So, yes, I, I suppose the nice way of putting that is to say that he's a, a pragmatist, that I think it's possible to say, uh, as a uh, university professor, Professor, he's more likely to to be able to uh, to think out of the box. Yeah, I mean, I remember when Jay Powell was appointed, it was like the lawyer. I mean, we do tend to kind of overreact very quickly and trying to like you know see inside the brains of of these economists. Okay, Mr. Kazuo Ueda is actually, I think, talking to Nikkei, uh, saying that it's important to keep the BOJ easing for now. Are we going to interpret? Are you interpreting Nick like you know word by word now? to see what he will do as Bank of Japan governor if he gets appointed, or do we just need cooler heads for the moment? I think um, the, the chances are that um, the, the people are uh, cautious about doing this job because it's so difficult to do. At the end of um, a person's career, they're worried about their, uh, their legacy, and it's very hard to do this. So uh, e even more so than, uh, than the U.S. or the Bank of England, here is a country with uh, debt to GDP of about 260 percent. It's already bought. I'd calculate about 56 percent of the, uh, the JGB market. Its holdings are, uh, 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 what, 105 percent of GDP. So um, this is going to be hard to, uh, to handle. My guess is that the, the BOJ is in an unsustainable position, and, and whoever, even if it were uh, Amamiya, that it would be uh, forced to or end up uh, allowing rates to, uh, to drift up a little bit. Because basically, since the beginning of uh, December, it has bought 43.3 uh, trillion yen in, uh, in bonds. That's 7.8 percent of, of GDP, an enormous amount of buying yeah. just to hold the, uh, uh, the YCC ceiling. I have to correct myself because I said this was the Nikkei, but actually comes from NHK, which is, of course, uh, the Japanese public broadcaster. Nick, this is the very latest on Mr. Ueda saying it's important to keep the BOJ easing for now. If you look at uh, so, yeah, what role does the prime minister play in this, is the market, again, really focused uh, on this interplay between what the prime minister wants and the fact that the deputy governor has said no to the job? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 as I said in a report um, uh, last night, um, as we learned from the, uh, the philosopher Mick Jagger, you don't always get what you want. And I, I think um, the, the prime minister, you've got to remember, he's from the fourth largest faction in the, um, in the LDP. So um, I think Ueda has, has criticized coronomics at, uh, at a number of points. Uh, he may not be the person that, uh, that the, the biggest factions want. They want someone who's a lot more dovish than this. So we may find that um, we have a, a, a lot of uh, market volatility on Monday and on, um, on when, when it comes to a vote in Parliament that the, uh, the other factions are not supporting this. So it looks absolutely yeah. shambolic at the moment. I mean, I would love, Mick Jagger, I'm sure, also has a Euro Yen call, so we need to get him on the phone. What's your take on how much volatility we'll have until we actually have someone locked and loaded, like appointed by the government? Well, there's been talk of um, whoever it is that they would do a, um, a uh, study at the Bank of Japan into the, uh, the risks and rewards of the, the policies that they've already had in place. So I think we're going to have volatility for a, quite a while while we, we work out exactly what we've got here. Um, and with a, um, a, a less known uh, character there, I think that um, a lot of traders are going to be taking liberties with the, uh, the market. and try to, to see how far they can push the, uh, the Bank of Japan. So volatility on currency markets, on equities, um, and on the bond market. Nick, thanks so much. Nick Smith, CLSA Securities Japan strategist, with the very latest on yen. Now, oil also gaining. That's after Russia's deputy prime minister said Moscow plans to cut its oil production in March by half a million barrels a day in response to the Western price cap. Well, joining us now is Will Kennedy, Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities. Well, thank you so much for joining us. My first question is actually, we're seeing about a 2% rise for the price of oil. It was rising before this announcement. So does this have to do with the 500,000 barrels being cut or, or is it just a general market sentiment? 
Well, oil had had a slightly better week. I think people are um, optimistic about the demand outlook. But yes, I think this morning uh, the announcement did uh, clearly boost price and, and add to the gains that we'd already seen this week, and yeah. it, it jumped a little bit. Um, a very good question for Ordan Tillis. Why was this not priced in? They had said they would retaliate. Well, they've been saying it for some time, uh, but they had never put any details on it and they'd never followed through. Uh, I think people were wondering whether it was an empty threat or exactly what they would do. This is the first time that they've actually put some meat on the bones of these threats and um, 500,000 barrels a day, about 0.5% of global oil supply, yeah, is so a significant intervention. It, it is significant. I don't know whether it points to the strength of the Russian economy or, and, and whether we can make up for those lost barrels elsewhere. Well, the interesting question, I think, is how voluntary this cut really is. Clearly, they're going to paint it as a positive choice of retaliation against Western sanctions. But the important thing to understand about the market right now is that we had, on February the 5th, uh, Europe stopping the import of oil products. And that was a huge source of uh, petroleum demand for the Russian oil system and all that diesel which was uh, coming out of Russian refineries and going into uh, the European system isn't happening anymore and there's a danger that they can't place that elsewhere and that will back up the refining system. So I think there are some people in the market who will tell you that they had to do this because sanctions are now beginning to be so strong that it's hard for Russia to place all its barrels. And Novak hinted at that it's in his statement because he said we will not sell our oil under the price cap regime. Um, so it is perhaps forced on Russia uh, to some extent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Shoel Kennedy, of course, who oversees all of our coverage for oil and commodities. Coming up, South Africa's president declares a state of disaster over power outages in an attempt to stem the growing tide of rolling blackouts. We'll have plenty more on that story next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. South Africa has declared a state of disaster over the country's ongoing energy crisis. The declaration means essential services like hospitals and water treatment plants may be exempt from power blackouts. We spoke exclusively to South Africa's Minister for Public Enterprises. Within 12 to 18 months, we must see the end of load shedding, and it'll happen in two principal ways. One, by adding more uh, megawatts to the system, and many of the renewable projects will be coming online uh, during that period, later this year and into next year. And secondly, making sure that the existing plant works a lot more efficiently. We're now joined by Yale University senior fellow and former Goldman Sachs chief executive for sub-Saharan Africa, Colin Coleman. Colin, thank you for joining us. What does a state of disaster mean for South Africa right now? Well, thanks very much, Francine, for having me. Uh, look, South Africa is in, in a three-way interdependent crisis, which is low economic growth, failing infrastructure in particular, the load shedding and energy crisis, and ra rising organized crime, failing policing. So I think the president acknowledged this in the State of the Nation last night. And this declaration of an emergency is really a, an indication of the severity of the crisis and the need for a very rapid response. We all hope the minister, Gordon, is correct with his 12 to 18 month forecast, but South Africans are, are a little bit uh, tired, you know, of the ongoing uh, collapse of energy, the load shedding and so on, and its dramatic effect on the economy. So uh, yeah. the president has made some announcements. I think effectively what we need, and there's no quick fixes, to it is we need a combined economic stimulus to get economic growth going. That will only really be revealed in the Minister of Finance's budget speech in about 10 days' time. Uh, we need to get a stabilization of this uh, power situation, energy, ports and rail, uh, and this will certainly help uh, bring about focus, uh, manage the load shedding, uh, avoid uh, knock-on impacts on strategic services like hospitals and so on, which is helped by this state of emergency. And we also yep. absolutely need to strengthen the state capacity to manage the situation. 
But so, Colin, how would you say so far the government has handled these crises? Well, it's been underwhelming, I would say. You know, the, uh, the situation has deteriorated uh, significantly. There is not a sufficient lockstep interaction between the different spheres of government. Uh, and we've had to see, uh, unfortunately, the ESCOM CEO, I regard it highly, Andre de Reiter, uh, resign, and a new appointment has to be made to the CEO of ESCOM. Uh, and the board of ESCOM, which was reappointed, is just getting going. So we, we hope that with the president's, uh, you know, bold steps now, and he also said he was going to appoint a dedicated minister of electricity in his office, that all the ministers move in one direction together uh, and that we see uh, a significant upping of the provision of uh, funding to recapitalize ESCOM, uh, which again we'll see in the Minister of Finance's speech, that we see no. uh, unlocking but of Colin, the IPP renewable sector and the maintenance right. and improvement of generation and the power Do plants. Do you think there needs to be a government reshuffle to push all of these reforms through quickly? Well, it's common cause that the president intends and has to reshuffle his cabinet to fill vacancies. Uh, this is going to be a critical decision he makes because we all know big organizations run on people choices. Uh, and so the choices he makes now is going to be absolutely critical on the back of his uh, re-election as president of the ruling party. He has the political capital. I think uh, from recent interactions, he has a very strong understanding of the problems. Now it's a question of navigating the political environment to make the right appointments. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the massive infrastructure drive? How will that help South Africa going forward? And what does it mean for investors maybe wanting to get into there? Look, I think the investors want to see stable power supply what we call backbone infrastructure, in particular, that we given a mining economy and uh, agricultural exports of fruit and vegetables and so on uh, into, into Europe. They, they want to know that there is a, a logistics that works, and that means road, rail, and port networks being able to export product uh, and get that product out. And we have a very strong commodity backdrop, as you know, uh, which is, is to the benefit of South Africa. So I think if, if the, we can get a more stable energy environment and some basic steps happening to stabilize uh, the port infrastructure, we, with those two steps, are going to take giant leaps forward. I think the investors yeah. like the story of South Africa. They like the fact that we are a, 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 a very uh, fluid and liquid capital market mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, they can, uh, you know, they can easily get in and out of their investments. Uh, and we have a constitutional and judicial uh, setup that is, is to the strength, whereas other emerging markets may not be the case. Uh, so, so South Colin, Africa is an attractive backdrop for emerging market investors. Um, Colin, can I just ask you, you know, something that we touched on in the beginning with the national state of disaster? Does this allow the government to go, you know, more quickly? I guess time is of the essence, or do you worry that this pushes everything back? No, it will, it will uh, allow them to accelerate activities uh, and to overcome licensing, legislative and uh, environmental obstacles. And this is one of the reasons why the ruling party was pushing for this. I think there's general uh, appreciation. It's, not, it's, it's a controversial move. There's some detractors. But I think generally people will say uh, the state of emergency or the state of, of uh, this, uh, this, this, um, sta this, this, this intervention will assist in moving things forward. But it's not the only thing, right? So we need to, get, as we all know, these issues are technical issues, operating issues, financial issues. We need to get, you know, 200 billion rand uh, of debt taken off the government balance sheet. Is that going to happen when the Minister of Finance releases his budget yeah. speech on the 22nd of February? Yeah, that's the next target point. Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Colin Coleman, former Goldman Sachs chief executive for Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, coming up, we track some of the notable stocks on the move, including Adidas. The stock tumbled this morning after the giant warned of a possible 700 million euro loss from the Yeezy fallout. That's next, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here are the stocks on the move that we have your eyes on, well, our eyes on. Uh, and we have a couple of fun ones. Joe Easton from our equities team. Hi, Joe. That's right. So we're starting with Stan Chart here in the UK, the big M&A news in the banking space. Overnight, we did see FAB, First Abu Dhabi, saying that they are not considering an offer for the UK lender. That stock, you'll remember, rallied yesterday about 11%. And today, we're seeing those shares trimming that by about half. But the stock's still remaining up around 5% since yesterday, even after today's 4.3% drop. Some people in the market clearly think that that deal still has legs. It is a very attractive company, given its big Asia footprint. But there could potentially be some regulatory concerns, given it has a U.S. clearinghouse and the Treasury there in the U.S. might have some worries about their China exposure, potentially a stumbling block for that deal. That stock down 4%, as I mentioned. Then I'm going to go on to the fun one today. Not so fun for Adidas shareholders. That stock is dropping this morning after the company warns that it could face a 700 million euro loss following them cutting ties with Kanye West, now known as Ye. So this comes, of course, as they sever that relationship after his anti-Semitic commentary. They're now predicting their sales could drop by a high single-digit percent this year. Analysts were looking for those sales to be up 5%, so clearly not one for the gold diggers, if I can squeeze in a cheap pun there on the hip-hop references. They're actually losing a bit of market share anyway to Nike and Lululemon as well, so it's been a pretty bad run for that company at the moment. The final one I'm looking at, I'm moving over to HelloFresh, the meal pack subscription company. That stopped dropping today. Just bringing it up on the screen there. That stock was down around 7% last time I checked. JP Morgan going underweight for the first time in two years. They're worried about people unsubscribing to HelloFresh. The company's not adding enough new clients and may have to really splash out on marketing in order to attract some new people onto that subscription. They're giving it a street low price target of 22 euros. You can see it at 23 euros at the moment, down about 7%, as I say. They've not been passing their cost inflation onto consumers as well because they're worried that would cause even more people to quit the meal pack product. So HelloFresh getting hit today by that JP Morgan downgrade down at 7% at the moment in Frankfurt. Joe, thank you so much. Are you a user of HelloFresh? I was, but I think I was one of the many people that quit when lockdown ended. So, yeah, how about yourself? There you go. No, I'm, I, I like cooking, so I like to start from scratch with a lot of frustration that's, and nervousness as well. That's the best way to do it. But Joe Easton there from our equities team, always, always on point. Now, this is a picture across the board. When you look at markets, there's one thing that we need to watch out for, and that's uh, yen. The BOJ report really sent yen uh, moves. Uh, report saying that the academic, as well, Ueda, will be nominated as chief of the BOJ. He's a surprise. This is according to Nikkei. This Nikkei report also says that uh, the government's favorite, Mr. Amamiya, had actually declined. To be clear, while UAID appears to have said it's important to continue monetary easing given the current conditions, uh, a lot of analysts are also saying he did not elaborate or make other substantive comments or confirm his nomination. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York, Anna Edwards in London, and this is Bloomberg. Probably the first reaction of the market is the uh, new jack reaction to whatever the name is different from Mr. Mamiya. But Mr. Weather has been a uh, uh, generally dovish when he was in with the BOJ. There is a perception uh, that we, he will be more hawkish and hence we've seen um, that uh, uh, rally in the yen. And look what happened um, over the past few months as we've seen the uh, rally in the yen from the high 140s to 130 or so right now um, against the dollar. It will be, this will provide a good balance between the fresh uh, eyes and also the deep knowledge about the, what is the BOJ is all about. To take positions right now on the back of this uh, is quite risky because it's conjecture. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller.
It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. A surprise at the Bank of Japan. The yen rises after Prime Minister Fumio Kishida reportedly picks a former BOJ board member to take over at the central bank in April. Russia retaliates. Moscow plans to cut oil production in response to price caps imposed by the West. And shares of Adidas are slumping today. The German sports shoemaker warns of an operating loss after ending its lucrative brand deal with the rapper Ye. Welcome to Boomback Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, an incredible uh, a lot of news flow coming at us this morning in the early hours here, well certainly the early hours stateside, uh, just early in the morning here in Europe, getting this reporting. It is still just reporting about succession over at the BOJ. We didn't expect to hear more on this until Valentine's Day. Yeah, no, but we got a surprise name that really made the story exciting again, not just for traders, um, but also for economists and policy wonks, right? Because there's this great argument about whether or not he's hawkish or at least not dovish, or maybe he's dovish or at least not hawkish. Take a look at what's going on in the yen right now. Um, you can see the dollar weakening against the yen, so the yen gaining some strength. You can only buy 130.88 yen for $1. Previously, you could buy more than 100 before this uh, news story popped up. And it's, by the way, popped up across a number of different um, Japanese newspapers. Uh, you, you could buy more than 131 yen for a dollar. So you have seen that move. and. That debate's going to play out throughout the day. If you're excited about central bank policy debates, definitely stay tuned to Bloomberg. Um, we'll be talking about this for the entire day. The Nikkei right now <laughs> up a, a 31 basis points or up um, a third of 1%. So closing higher, uh, at least that news hasn't hurt the stock market. Maybe they, uh, equity market uh, participants, have decided that he isn't hawkish or even is dovish. As I say, you can um, pick either one from moves he's made in the past past votes he's made at the Bank of Japan, but, you know, 20 years ago or, um, you know, posts that he's made over the last eight years, a post that he made in July looked relatively dovish. I wanted to put a Donnie in here, by the way. It has fallen more than 10 percent at one point, but it's rebounded quite a bit. That's because not only has the MSCI changed the weighting of not only a Donnie, Donnie any Enterprises, but a, I believe four other or four in total uh, stocks because of a free float de uh, determination. But Adani has hired Wachtell, one of the biggest U.S. law firms. So we could see more drama in this story as well. It could really bring the legal action that's threatened against the short seller that forced Adani stock uh, uh, prices down and bond prices down so dramatically over the past few weeks. We also see the Hang Seng right now uh, down about 2%. This is interesting because in China we got inflation out at 2.1%. So it's returned inflation has as the economy's opened up, but it's still fairly muted, uh, a fairly muted level at 2.1%, especially for the numbers we're used to seeing over the past couple of decades from this economy. They can get so high, and that means there's room for the central bank to continue to act in terms of stimulus to drive the economy up, but it hasn't helped stocks in Hong Kong. In terms of what we're looking at in the U.S. this morning, not a lot of action yet in the S&P futures. We're down about a third of 1%. We're going to get a couple of Fed speakers today, including Patrick Harker, who's talking at a crypto conference on the West Coast, which I think is interesting. Bitcoin, by the way, back down under 22,000 at 21,831. We also see the 10-year yield moving up about three basis points, so investors are selling this debt. And then finally, um, but I, I should say last but not least, is NYMEX crude. In fact, Brent, I think, an even bigger move to the upside. Right now, a 2.5% gain for West Texas Intermediate to about $80 a barrel after news that the Russians are going to cut production mm. by 500,000 barrels a day. And also another one of the huge stories that I'm sure make, makes even bigger waves in Europe where you have uh, indexes much hev more, more heavily weighted to the energy complex. Yeah, absolutely. So the global story that we're focused on from a central banking perspective, as you say, is very much about Japan. But there are plenty of other stories that really are cutting through. And certainly here in Europe, the energy story is one of those then, Matt. Broadly speaking, we see negativity across European equity markets, not quite so much in London as elsewhere. And that's where you see that weighting that, Matt, you were talking about towards energy stocks, which we'll get to in a moment. But broadly speaking, we're catching up with the negativity we saw on Wall Street yesterday. A lot of that driven by a higher rates environment. And we'll be speaking to PIMCO later on this hour about where that heads, because that's uh, important 
important evolution in US policy that we need to keep watching, of course. Let's roll on and show you some of the individual movers that we have uh, contributing here. And Brent Crude is, is one of those. As Matt was pointing out, incredible news flow surrounding uh, this asset as well. The Russians now saying that they are going to cut back on production. We've had this comment before. This now coming from Alexander Novak. We've had these comments before. They've threatened to do this in the past. We'll see what happens here. Uh, but clearly, this could be a disappointment to the architects of the sanctions arrangement who had wanted to avoid a situation where Russia cuts back on production. But that's what they're threatening to do right now. 86.50 is where we trade on Brent. These are energy stocks then moving in tandem with that up by 1.5%. Uh, we've got the euro against the dollar here. Uh, fairly flat. A little bit of a movement down was in the euro, down 3 tenths of 1%. And Standard Chartered is down by 3.7% uh, this morning. This after a strong rally yesterday on speculation. Uh, sorry, no, on, on um, some reporting uh, around whether uh, um, uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank might be interested in buying the business. That has been denied this morning, and so the stock retreats, Matt. Fab. I love... Is it FAB? Do we call it FAB, First Abu Dhabi, or I'm is sure it just you Fab? Can. I like Fab. Uh, all right, let's get back to the top story in central banking. As you said, Anna, a surprise at the Bank of Japan. The yen is rising on multiple reports, and these are as yet still unconfirmed reports, that Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will nominate Katsuo Ueda to take over the central bank in April. Giroi Reedy of Bloomberg Opinion joins us now from Tokyo for the details. And I think, um, uh, Giroud, an important point of the story is that Amamiya was not, or at least it's reported, was not interested in taking the job. So now they're going with choice number two, and he may be less dovish. Absolutely. I mean, I think we'll have to see why Amamiya did not want the job. It certainly is a curious sort of twist in the tale, given that he certainly appeared to be, obviously, he was the, you know, the number one contender and the most people wanted uh, or expected to see him, I should say. Um, I think the fact that he was approached, according to these reports, and turned it down indicates that the choice of Ueda, who I should say, you know, is quite a surprise, indicates that it might not be as hawkish a tilt as I think the markets first interpreted it as. I think the markets were set up to take anyone who wasn't Amamiya as a sort of a hawkish turn by Kishida turning away from, you know, a decade of Kuroda. But the fact that Amamiya was offered the job but didn't want it would certainly indicate to me, at least, that I think Kishida isn't looking for for a huge change in monetary policy. Mm, is there any sense, Gary, that that, uh, uh, Gary, that he has been away from central banking for a little while, he's uh, been in academia, and so there is a sense that maybe some fresh thinking is being sought? I think that would be certainly one way to approach it. Another way might be as a sort of like safe pair of hands. You might think, um, we'll have to see you know, what he has to say. The first, the only thing that he has said so far, uh, reporters did catch him uh, earlier on uh, today, and he did say that he thought it was important to continue with the current monetary, monetary easing framework. So I certainly don't think he's, you know, he's he's going to be a, a radical departure. I think in some sectors of the market, people are set up for a, you know, a gigantic U-turn or an about face by the Bank of Japan away from from easing and towards, you know, the sort of tightening that we've seen from other central banks, but. Um, uh, I certainly, personally, I don't think that's that's on the cards, and I don't think Ueda does either. We saw some of his his writing last year where he was saying that um, he thought uh, there was a lot of danger in premature tighten, tightening, and he didn't think it was likely that the Bank of Japan would be able to ease in the current uh, inflationary environment. All right, Garod, so a lot going on here. We're going to continue, obviously, talking about this excitement at the BOG. Thanks for, BOJ, thanks very much for joining us on what is in Tokyo pretty late on a Friday night. Now, oil gaining today after Russia's deputy prime minister said Moscow plans to cut its oil production in March by half a million barrels a day in response to the Western price cap. Paul Wallace, Bloomberg Energy and Commodities Editor, joins us now for more. So, Paul, how much of a surprise is this cut and how much does it play into the market action? Hi, Matt. Well, we certainly had a bit of a reaction uh, in the oil market and Brent's up, up today about 2.7% uh, uh, the last time I checked, although um, it might have, uh, it might have um, uh, softened that rise uh, somewhat. So, yes, there are clearly some traders that are a bit surprised by this. Uh, and that probably didn't see Russia uh, going ahead with any production cuts. But it, 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 I think it's important to note that Alexander Novak did flag as recently as uh, November or even December that Russia could do this. Um, it's very much in line with his comments back then when he said that 
uh, Moscow could lower output by 500,000 to 700,000 uh, barrels a day in early 2023. 20, uh, and um, in his statement today, he said they would cut it by 500,000 barrels. One interesting point which people will really be watching for and trying to find out is whether this is really voluntary, as he, as Alexander Novak says it is, or whether it's been forced on them because they simply cannot find um, uh, alternative markets to all the fuel and uh, crude that they were previously selling to mm. Europe. That's a really interesting point, and certainly one that I'm, I'm sure our reporting will focus on then, uh, uh, Paul. And, and worth saying, as you, as you mentioned, that Novak has made these comments in the past. It's certainly not the response that those who designed the price cap wanted to see, although there have been plenty of warnings that this could happen. So who can fill the gap? Can anybody fill the gap? Can OPEC Plus step up? Would they? Um, OPEC Plus could. They have the capacity there, but um, the most recent um, reporting that we've got, um, including some from earlier this morning before this Russian announcement um, from OPEC watchers, suggested that uh, the Saudi Arabians uh, were not um, uh, keen to increase production this year, and they were very much on uh, um, sort of in hold mode, and that they weren't looking to unwind some of their cuts from late last year until 2024. We'll have to see if today's announcement changes that, but I think it's unlikely uh, that they would have been taken um, aback by this news because of what Novak was was saying uh, late last year and it was uh, it was certainly the case that a lot of um, oil traders and analysts were seeing a reduction in uh, Russian uh, output this year it was just a question um, of um, of how much all right Paul thanks very much for that reporting I will say that as you were speaking we got some headlines crossing from Interfax, which cites the Kremlin in saying that Russia has discussed these oil output cuts with OPEC plus members, as well as um, telling Interfax that uh, Vladimir Putin is going to address the Federal Council on February 21st, I guess, um, regarding these cuts as well and uh, oil production. Now, let's get to some consumer stories that are moving in the markets big time. Adidas, or Adidas, uh, warns that it may report an operating loss of as much as $750 million this year. That's after terminating a lucrative branding agreement with the rapper Kanye West, who I guess now is known as Just Ye. Joining us now from Bloomberg is, uh, from Berlin is Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. So, Oliver, how much of an impact has this had on Adidas shares? can have on a major company like Adidas down some 10, 11 percent this morning. And it's down, as you say, just to this termination of this, uh, this partnership, um, the Yeezy brand um, that was you know, dissolved in October after he made some anti-Semitic remarks. The Adidas before that point had called it the most successful partnership of its kind in the industry in history. And if you look at, we talked about the operating profit, if you look at the revenue, this could cost Adidas 1.2 billion euros in revenue this coming year. That's the worst case scenario. And these relationships really are the fuel in the tank for a lot of these companies. There's a similar relationship with Beyonce that Adidas has, the Ivy Park brand. But we had uh, reports from the Wall Street Journal overnight that sales from that are down 50 percent last year. So there's no guarantee, even with you know one of the most uh, decorated, celebrated artists. Um, you have a new CEO in January. He just took over. He says that he, they have to put back the pieces together, and they need some time to do so. And it's a tale you see in the stock this morning, but also longer term. If you look at Nike versus Adidas over time, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were $60 billion in market cap difference between these companies. This morning, it's $160 billion. Oli, yeah, really fascinating. A really nice example of the risks for your brand of, of these kind of partnerships. Also some good news, though, uh, and there's, there's what Oliver was just describing uh, in terms of the battle of those two rivals. Sticking with the consumer-facing sector then, Oli, we also got some numbers, some good numbers coming out of L'Oreal. Bring us up to speed. Yeah, so sales up uh, 8%, a little bit over 8% in the fourth quarter. That beat analyst estimates. And it's down basically to strengthen the United States, despite some pretty some severe weakness in China. But the U.S. really, um, the consumer holding up there, drastic slowdown, they said, in the luxury sector in China. Um, and looking ahead, you know, we see a little bit more of this coming. The U.S. holding up, the Europe also holding up. But, uh, you know, I know we're speaking to the CEO. You're speaking to the CEO a little bit later today. Um, the, they're saying that there might be a rebound in the second quarter in China after the COVID zero has been uh, rolled back. Uh, shares are down, you know, slightly this morning, about one and a half percent, but year to date up about 12 percent. 
Ollie, thanks very much. Uh, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook joining us there from Berlin with some of the uh, corporate movers we're keeping an eye on. We will be talking earnings and growth strategy, as Ollie said, with the CEO of L'Oreal. That conversation coming up later this hour. We'll also get back to the bond markets. We'll talk to Geraldine Sundstrom, PIMCO Europe portfolio manager. What does she make of the ever-inverting twos, tens yield curve in the United States and what's the impact on Europe? This is Bloomberg. We have a great chart of the yen action today after it was reported by the Nikkei that Ueda was nominated to lead the Bank of Japan. Um, Amamiya had been reported to lead the Bank of Japan or approached apparently back on uh, February 6th. And you can see where the yen was trading um, in regards to the dollar. You could buy 132 yen to the dollar. After this report from the Nikkei uh, news source and from a few other news sources in Japan that Actually, Amamiya uh, declined, and Ueda, um, who is regarded by some as more hawkish, some see him as uh, dovish regarding his past actions, after he was reported, it dropped to 130 yen, the amount that you could buy for a dollar. So the yen basically strengthening against the U.S. dollar. Joining us now is Ven Rom, Bloomberg Cross Asset Strategist. And Ven, I understand that you know one of his votes 20 years ago was considered dovish. Then he wrote some uh, hawkish posts over the past couple of decades until last July when he wrote a dovish post. What do we make of this guy? Morning, Matt. I think that, you know, it's useful to think of Ueda as a pragmatist more than as a dovish guy or as a hawkish guy. I think he's what what you can pass from his comments over the, over time is that he really is the man for the hour and he gets the job done. And he sees policy in the context of the global macro economy. So he's not outright hawkish or outright dovish. He's willing to change his policies in 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 step with the economy, in, in step with what the economy needs. And at this point, passing his comments from previously, I think it is fair to say that he's the guy for the hour, and he's going to kind of probably do away with curve control. Though I do think that he's not going to start raising rates in a hurry. You don't think he's going to start raising rates in a hurry. I mean, that's what people want to know, isn't it, Ven? From an international perspective, you know, this is one of the one of the remaining G20 countries where we see uh, rates as low as they are, where we see yield curve control, where we see dovish policy. It stands out as quite an outlier in that context. And so the market will be clamoring to understand, in a very up-to-date sense, what he plans to undo in Japanese policy and what he doesn't. Absolutely, and I think that you know the JGB market has become completely dysfunctional now because because uh, of the amount that the BOJ has to spend every every other day defending the curve control. So I I do think that that's that curve control policy is out of date, even though Ueda said this morning reportedly said this morning that the BOJ's policy current policy stands for now. I think for now is the operative part there. I do think that, you know, he's not going to probably come in in April and say, you know, in one fell swoop, do away with curve control. I do, though I do think that he's going to do that eventually. But he's not mm. going to, at the same time, he's going to acknowledge just functionalities in the market and he's going to scare, scrap curve control. But is he willing to go beyond that? We don't know yet. Yeah. OK, so a lot we still need to ascertain, a lot to hear from him, of course, if he ends up being the appointed candidate. And we've heard this morning uh, from the Japanese government that they plan to stick with Tuesday next week or the, the 14th of, of February, at least, as the announcement date for the BOJ nomination. So we'll see what that delivers. Thanks very much to Ven Ram of the Bloomberg Markets Live team. On the Markets Live blog, they're, of course, all over this story. Plenty to say on the Japanese succession story at the BOJ. They're also all over the OPEC story. And I should say, with that in mind, we've just got some headlines crossing the Bloomberg on that subject. OPEC Plus will not boost supply in reaction to a Russia cut. This according to OPEC Plus delegates. Uh, this, our reporters reaching out to them, no doubt, and, uh, and getting this kind of commentary. So we're this story moving thick and fast, as is the one at the BOJ. If you want more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. 
The death toll in those earthquakes in Turkey and Syria has now risen to more than 20,000 people. Experts fear tens of thousands more people are buried under the rubble. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is facing mounting criticism over the country's poor construction record. He's also been criticized for the government's response to the quakes. Russia launched multiple cruise missile attacks on Ukraine early today. Ukraine says the targets were critical infrastructure in several cities. Meanwhile, Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz has asked European leaders to deliver German-made tanks to Ukraine as promised. The goal is to have 80 of the Leopard 2 tanks there by the end of March. In China, consumer inflation accelerated last month following the nation's reopening from COVID-0. The consumer price index rose 2.1 percent from a year earlier. Meanwhile, the producer price index fell eight-tenths of one percent. Coming up, Geraldine Sundstrom, PIMCO Europe Portfolio Manager, joins us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. A surprise at the Bank of Japan. The yen rises after Prime Minister Fumio Kishida reportedly picks a former BOJ board member to take over the central bank in April. Russia retaliates. Moscow plans to cut oil production in response to price caps imposed by the West. And shares of Adidas slumping today. The German sports shoemaker warns of an operating loss after ending its lucrative brand deal with the rapper Ye. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, the new is coming thick and fast in the shape of the oil markets and also headlines from the BOJ as we look ahead to what could be a weaker session in the U.S. Yeah, it could be a weaker session in the U.S., but the fo focus is firmly on the Bank of Japan and really a dramatic succession story that's unraveling there uh, right now. The U.S. dollar is um, right now weaker against the Japanese yen, so it can buy less than 131 yen. The yen strengthening against the dollar um, on some news that a new head of the BOJ has been chosen, and some see him as hawkish, others see him as not hawkish, others maybe even dovish. Ueda is the man's name. Uh, so so we had the yen uh, trading at 132. You could buy 132 yen um, for a dollar, but it strengthened on this report. The Nikkei closing up three tenths of one percent. Now earlier I said it was closing, but actually it had closed long ago. I'm so used to thinking of Japanese time from German time since I lived in Berlin <laughs> for so long. Uh, but luckily one of my trader friends reached out to me. So shout out to Anthony Santos Stefano of Cabrera Capital for Writing my wrong, as you so often do. I really appreciate you watching and uh, trading through the night. We also have a Donnie Green Energy right now falling after news that Moody cut its outlook on a Donnie Green Energy to negative. Now, there's so much going on with a Donnie still today after that Hindenburg report a couple of weeks ago. Um, we have the MSCI reducing the free float of at least four Adani uh, stocks in its index, or the weighting, I should say, of four Adani stocks in its index because it's reduced its uh, determination of the free float. And Adani has hired Wachtell, one of the biggest U.S. law firms, um, likely to bring that legal action it had promised against Hindenburg. So it'll be interesting to see that go forward. The Hang Seng uh, down 2%, and actually we got inflation out of China, which was a good sign, I guess, that things are picking up after the reopening, the COVID reopening, but it was only 2.1%. So that's relatively muted, and you could see investors bet that there's going to be more stimulus coming from cent the central bank and central authorities there. So watch this space tomorrow. In terms of what's going on in the U.S., S&P futures now down half a percent. Um, of course, the final trading session of the week, and we're going to have at least two, by my count, Fed speakers today. So watch out for them reminding markets that they want to see rates higher for longer. The 10-year yield right now at 368.83. NYMEX crude, we've been talking about the cut, the Russian cut there, 500,000 uh, barrels a day in production. And OPEC now coming out and saying they're not going to make up for that production cut. So you have continued strength of NYMEX crude right now, 79.94 a barrel for uh, West Texas Intermediate. And of course, you're going to see that play throughout the oil complex and Brent as well in just a moment. And then I finally thought I would include Bitcoin here because even though you have the U.S. dollar actually 
actually strengthening the broader Bloomberg dollar index. Sorry, weakening the broader Bloomberg dollar index is weakening. Um, you do have Bitcoin falling as well below 22,000. Um, so it's getting a little bit out of the range it's worked it w itself into the last few weeks right now at 21,817. In terms of pre-market movers, there's a lot going on there as well today. So um, it's not just a mellow Friday. Lyft coming out with profits um, that disappointed and a warning. And that stock is down by a third in uh, the pre-market this morning. Watch that at the open. And of course, watch others like Uber in sympathy. Ford is dropping big in the pre-market, 8.2%. But don't worry, it's just gone ex-dividend. So today is the first day um, that you can buy Ford shares without the right to last quarter's not only regular cash but also special cash dividend. That's why the drop uh, is there, so it's a bit of a technical move. Coinbase off uh, 2 percent here after Kraken was told by the SEC that some products it offers were illegal and or at least should be treated as securities. And Coinbase had some of those same products. So watch uh, the reaction from Coinbase and the reaction in the shares today. And then PayPal also down uh, about a half a percent right now. Volume growth on PayPal's platform slowed even faster than expected in the final three months of last year. It's another sign of faltering consumer spending there and may be a concern. Anna, what do you see in Europe? Yeah, there's a lot going on in Japan, a lot going on in the bond markets in the United States. There's so much to talk about globally. Here in Europe, we're feeling the effects of the higher rate environment that we saw hitting Wall Street yesterday. So Europe playing catch up down by 1.2%. One sector that's not in negative territory, though, today is the energy sector, oil stocks, energy majors on the rise, partly to do with this. Matt just was showing the WTI price almost back up at $80 a barrel. Here's Brent at 86.55, up by 2.5%. And that's after uh, Russia has announced it's going to cut back on its production uh, of oil in response to Western sanctions. Here's the pound at 120.94. A little bit of movement in the pound, but really the macro story here is pretty interesting. Does it tell us anything about other geographies as well? We've seen some resilience in no uh, October and November in the GDP data for the UK. So even though December was pretty bad, it meant that we managed to avoid a technical recession that will, of course, take on a political life of its own, that conversation. Standard Chartered down by 4.8% as the First Abu Dhabi Bank denies that they are once again having a look at Standard Chartered and could consider buying uh, the Emerging Markets Focus Bank, which was trading heavily to the upside in yesterday's session. Let me just get to another story. I mentioned the oil story out of Russia. Uh, well, this is another Russian story. We've had uh, Russia's central bank. They've picked up where they left off last year by keeping interest rates unchanged, so no change from the central bank in Russia. Russia, but crucially, they have signaled that they will consider hikes at forthcoming meetings. So that having a bit of an impact, as you can see, on uh, the ruble, not the market it once was, not played internationally in the same way that it once was, but for, 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 uh, but for whatever, there's the movement that we're seeing on it. Policymakers <laughs> held their benchmark at 7.5% then, in line with the forecast of all economists surveyed by Bloomberg. So no surprise, but a little bit of uh, movement as a result of that guidance then, Matt. Not the market it once was, but still uh, dramatic and interesting to watch indeed. Thank you very much for that. Now joining us is Geraldine and Sundstrom, PIMCO Europe Portfolio Manager. And Geraldine, uh, great to have you on a day when we have such exciting news from the Bank of Japan. I was listening to our reporter, Valerie Titel, earlier on Bloomberg Radio say that if uh, Ueda comes in and raises rates, even if you're not dealing with Japan at all, it's still so important to global investors because it's the last anchor, the last, you know, um, ZERP or NERP anchor that's holding rates down globally, whereas everyone else is already lifting off. What do you think about the possibility of a slightly more hawkish candidate coming in to run the BOJ? Yes, I think this has been flagged for a little bit. We could see already in swap curves people anticipating uh, the end of the zero interest rates and yield curve control to some extent. So this might just be, you know, the actual fact um, rather than the rumor. We're still, like you said earlier, trying to figure out um, this potential new governor and what this exactly means. But probably, you know, this governor will be like any other, having to look at the price of oil and the impact on inflation expectation. And that's probably um, the news that is uh, moving markets this morning. What do you see in terms of the global rates regime, Geraldine? I mean, um, rising for sure, and bankers from the Fed tell us they want to go higher for longer. That's kind of the message out of um, the major three central banks in the West. 
Are they really going to be able to stick to it and beat inflation, or are they going to have to turn tail and run when the economic situation turns down? Well, there's very much a game of liar's poker <laughs> um, in terms of the markets and the central bank um, to a point that maybe uh, the Fed has decided to not even emphasize things so much and let's agree to disagree. There's massive uncertainty in terms of the disinflation path. We know it, is, it has started, but how sticky will inflation be around this very critical 4% level to go towards two? So it really is going to be a, a mixture of factor. How resilient is the economy? Or maybe we're just fooling ourselves and these are just lags which take a lot longer to bite after reopening when backlog orders are so big. Um, and we find ourselves towards the end of the year with central bank actually cutting interest rates. Or if the economy is indeed resilient and the Fed cannot can cut interest rate and the market will be wrong. So I think at this stage, um, not mm. betting too hard on this macroeconomic outcome um, is the way to go and seek income and carry in portfolio is probably safer. OK, yes. Where do you go to seek that income and, uh, and that carry then, Geraldine? I mean, there have been a lot of people talking about the attractions of the bond market since the beginning of this year. Now we see rising rates again, maybe people questioning uh, that a little bit. But where do you see the opportunities? I think it's stick to things that are fairly safe, um, that have a bit of spread in securitized securities or a mortgage market, uh, high quality non-cyclical investment grade. All this part is probably OK, even if we were to have a recession, because it's likely to be pretty mild. Um, and be much more cautious when it comes to higher risk uh, securities, especially given the valuations that we have currently. The market has been very fast at the beginning of this year. It was the insta market of uh, immaculate disinflation. And, you know, this is a path that might be complex to achieve. Mm, let me ask you about corporate debt then. Um, there have been some who have been a little bit concerned in credit about the way that prices have risen, certainly soaring since the month of October or, or, or so, and some concern about whether they offer value anymore or whether we're going to see the European Central Bank get a little bit nervous about the way that spreads have contracted. What do you expect to see in, corporate, uh, in the corporate sphere? So certainly the riskier part of the market could be at risk if we were to have an economic slowdown and also the fact that interest rates are simply higher in absolute terms. The more cyclical part of the economy, the market has been very uh, easy uh, with cyclicals. They think there's no lending. So if there were to be one, there's probably some surprises in terms of this. However, let's say in the mortgage market, where loan to value are in fact pretty low, the unemployment rate is still very low. So there should be some resilience there and you can earn a healthy spread. So it's really to go in those more secure part of the market, much more investment grade, much more non-cyclical areas that are safe and not try to stretch too far on the risk spectrum. Do you expect a surprise out of China, Geraldine? I mean, we've had kind of a lackluster inflation print for the last month, but a reopening there could make a real difference in terms of the European economy, businesses and you know, uh, issuance plans. It's a double-edged sword. Um, of course, China reopening means more demand globally, and that could renew inflationary pressure uh, globally, and that could be a bit of a headache for central banks. We'll have to see what happens to oil prices. We know they are critical to the formation of inflation expectations among households, and central banks have been very focused on that. So, of course, uh, the news this morning, we've seen, you know, uh, Russia with this cut, the reply by OPEC, more demand from China, especially as mobility increase. This could complicate matters. And in a market that's already priced that inflation will be back down almost to central bank target by the end of this year, uh, could prove wrong. And so that's why at this juncture, probably also increasing inflation protected bonds in a portfolio makes sense. OK, Geraldine, thanks very much. Geraldine Sundstrom joining us there from PIMCO. Coming up on the programme, we will talk earnings and growth strategy with the CEO of L'Oreal waiting in the wings for us right now. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later this hour, an interview with Amy Howe, FanDuel CEO. That's at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with, in London with Matt Miller in New York. Now, L'Oreal sales growth has beaten expectations in the fourth quarter, despite some weakness in the China business. Bloomberg's Caroline Conan is uh, near Paris for us with the CEO of L'Oreal. Caroline. Thank you, Anna. And I'm very happy to be joined, as you say, uh, by Nicolas Hieronymus. He's the CEO, of course, of L'Oréal, the world's biggest cosmetics company uh, in the world. Uh, good, morning. Um, good morning, Caroline. We had uh, your uh, overall uh, sales number up 8.1% in the fourth quarter, like for like sales. Uh, that's beating our estimates. But we're still in this inflationary environment. Are you still seeing uh, consumers pacing out their visits to beauty salons, buying perhaps cheaper skincare products, or do you see some kind of coming back to premium brands? Well, first of all, thank you for highlighting our results. Uh, I have to say that I'm particularly happy in the name of the 87,000 uh, L'Orealians about these results. Uh, 38 billion uh, euros plus 18.5% published numbers are best since 99 and a growth that is 1.8 times the market. So that's a, a performance to, uh, that we are proud of. And this happens in a world, as you rightfully mentioned, which is uh, uh, in a great turmoil at, in many respects. And inflation is part of, this, uh, of these challenges we have to face. Today, uh, the market remained very dynamic. If we look at Q4, whether in Europe, where the market was at plus 12, in North America, where the second half was over plus 7%, we see consumers wanting to indulge in great beauty products. Actually, the market is premiumizing. There are consumers that might go to uh, lower end products, but we see our own consumers actually investing in quality. It's true in all product categories, and that makes us pretty confident for, uh, for 23, even though you know, we don't know everything about what's gonna happen this year, but the signs are positive. Do you believe that inflation may have peaked um, do you still suffer or do you think you're still going to suffer in 2023 from inflation of raw materials or transportation, for example? Well, we see already some of the raw materials uh, costs that are beginning to level off or some come down, like oil derivatives, silicones. Uh, we'll still have, we'll have a carryover on this year of this, uh, these increases that uh, hit us in 2022. We see transportation costs uh, going down, but then we see energy prices, which affect the cost of glass going up. So I think 2023 will still be a year where inflation impacts our PNL. But we've shown in 2022 that we could uh, offset this with innovation, new products at a uh, higher price, or even taking some price increases on our most uh, desirable brands and uh, offsetting uh, part of it to deliver strong growth in top line and in profits. China is obviously uh, one of your key uh, markets. Uh, you had some slowdown, especially in the luxury division because of COVID restrictions towards the end of last year. How do you see business in China this year? Well, I'm very uh, bullish and optimistic for China. First of all, in 22, we have to remind that the market was negative, mid, middle, mid single digit negative around mi minus 0.5. We did plus six. So it's 11 points gap with the market. So great tribute to our Chinese teams. And as the market is reopening, it's very promising. Uh, so indeed, as you mentioned, December and the beginning of January were not great because people were sick. But we see the early days of February uh, quite positive in terms of uh, store traffic, sellout. So I think uh, from Q2 onwards, uh, China should be uh, more of a growth driver in 2023 than it was in 2022. L'Oréal still has a plant in Russia, near Moscow. You're still selling what you call essential daily products in Russia. What is your long-term strategy in Russia? Is this plant still operating? Yeah, we, no, nothing's changed. Uh, you know, we are uh, more than respecting the, the sanctions imposed on Russia. We've stopped, stopped the vast majority of our brands, closed our store, stopped our advertising. But we keep uh, selling uh, a few uh, essential products which allow us to continue to, uh, to take care of our Russian employees and protect our assets. And at the same time, we continue to invest in supporting our Ukrainian employees. Some of them are here in Paris, but a lot of them are in Ukraine. So uh, that's, uh, that's how we, uh, we, we, we take care of them and take care of the future of the company. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you had about 2,200 employees in Russia before the war in Ukraine. Is that still the case? Did, did, did you have any layoffs there in Russia? No, we didn't do layoffs. You know, part of our employees were uh, beauty advisors and that were selling luxury brands. As we stopped the sale of luxury brands, some of these beauty advisors have uh, left the company, but we keep the core of our, of our employees who are very loyal L'Oreal employees for decades now. So do you believe uh, there will be a return of investment and growth there after well, the war, perhaps? Well, first of all, I hope, you know, the war comes to an end. This is a, a terrible uh, thing that has happened and hit us and hit the Ukrainian people uh, a year ago. Uh, and like everybody, I hope this war comes to uh, an end. And then we'll see what happens in the future. And I hope that uh, this part of the world can uh, go back someday to uh, uh, a more peaceful and normal life. I want to talk about U.S. customers a little bit. We had U.S. and uh, North America sales up 9.4% uh, compared to uh, plus 8.1% uh, in Europe. Obviously, U.S. customers also benefited from the strong dollar when they were shopping abroad, for example. Do you see this trend to continue? Well, we always welcome tourists uh, in Europe, uh, and whether they're American or Chinese, because the Chinese might come back uh, at spring or summer and, and discover some of our brands in, 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 uh, in France. But, but overall, we see what's, what's very important is wherever we are, in the US, in India, in Indonesia, and even in China, this appetite for beauty keeps on being confirmed period after period. People are investing in their beauty. They want new products. They want innovations. We are bringing lots of great new products in the beginning of the year. And therefore, we are confident that the beauty market will grow everywhere, including in the USA. And of course, we are determined to continue gaining share on these markets. You'll continue getting shares on this market. This was Nicolas Hieronymus, the L'Oréal CEO uh, from L'Oréal's headquarters near Paris. Anna? Caroline, thank you very much. Caroline Conan with the CEO of L'Oreal, as she says, near Paris. Thank you very much for, to Caroline for bringing us that really interesting interview covering many geographies. Let's go to Japan now. Joining us now on set, Derek Halpany, Head of Research for Global Markets, EMEA and International Securities at MUFG. And I say, good morning to you, Derek. I say let's go to Japan because that's clearly where a lot of the uh, macro news flow has come from. Lots of reporting around Kazuo Ueda about the possibility that he might be nominated by the government as BOJ governor. Uh, what do you know about him? What do we know about him and his very up-to-date thoughts on macro policy because a lot of the the search material you can you can turn up is quite dated it is and I've, I've spoken to a number of my Japanese colleagues in the bank today and what I kept hearing back from people I spoke to is that Ueda-san is an academic he's not political he's very pragmatic and he says what he sees mm -hmm. so when you look at the, the dollar yen reaction this morning, that to me was a classic example of people pulling materials of comments made by Uedisan over the years. Yeah. And there was something in there for everybody. Right. There were hawkish comments, there were dovish comments, and I think there was reactions either way to that. Yes. And even before you got to that material, if you'd found those hawk uh, hawkish and dovish comments, maybe we could have seen yen, uh, yen strengthening just on the fact it wasn't the dove that they were expecting. And that raised enough questions to send the yen a little higher. Exactly. Like, I think first and foremost, OK, it's not Amamiya-san. Mm. Therefore, positions that were in the market expecting that were quickly liquidated. And I think that was the bias was slightly in terms of yen weakness in that view. So that was the very initial response that we've had, which I think is very, very understandable. But I think as we settle, as we start to hear more information, and of course, if it, it is formally um, acknowledged that he is the, the choice, I would, I would say the markets will come back to the idea that he's a good pick. He's, he's got some excellent experience. He was on the investment committee for uh, the, the GPIF in Japan, mm. uh, the pension mm. fund. He's, he's, there's numerous comments about he was concerned about the, the, the time that might come when inflation is higher right. and the support for the JGB market and the BOJ might not be there. So he's been focused on that risk. He has the very good experience. Uh, and I think he is a, a credible choice. So, Derek, I wonder what you think of um, the yield levels, uh, the rate levels, I should say, now in, you know, the U.S., um, the U.K., and the EU, and how, you know, those would change if we lost this one anchor of low rates, right? The only major central bank left with a negative rate. If he 
manages to undo yield curve control and does start to raise rates in the face of inflation. And I realize that's a pretty big if. If he does, though, what happens to um, the global rate regime? Well, I think the, the first part of answering that question is, of course, to look back to the changes that took place in December. So when we had that surprise announcement of the adjustment in YCC by 25 basis points, there was, of course, a reaction in global bond markets. So the U.S. Treasury 10-year yield jumped by about 8 to 10 basis points. So there would obviously be a reaction. But I think, of course, that was a very big surprise and the markets weren't expecting it. I think you fast forward to today, and I think there's a, a greater element of change to YCC already incorporated into uh, global yields um, in, in, in Europe and the United States. So to answer your question, I think, of course, there would be a reaction. If it's abandoned completely, I wouldn't expect the BOJ to walk away. I think they would still be very, very active in containing the moves initially. But I think you should, based on the 10-year swap rate, trading 88 basis points today, and the spread historically, we're going to get a jump in yields for yeah. sure, possibly okay. to 1%. Derek, thank you very much. Derek Alpany of MUFG, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really fascinating insights into what's going on at the BOJ. We wait for further confirmation over the weekend, perhaps, or uh, on, Tuesday, on the 14th of February. This is Bloomberg.